Hello and welcome, happy Equinox, and thank you for joining us. My name is Alta Lynn Price, a translator from German and Italian, and, and a member of the Translators Collective Sedillon Company. We're delighted to be collaborating with the Center for Fiction to bring you this monthly series and are grateful for the Center's support. These translation clinics are intended as a knowledge sharing open sessions for translators and lovers of translation from all backgrounds and experience levels. Each month, we invite a different literary translator to present on or discuss a subject of their choice with a Sedilla member, followed by a Q&A with attendees. Topics may range from questions and theories of craft to submissions, contracts, and other practical concerns, always with an eye to literary translation as a profession. Attendees are encouraged to bring questions from their own practice. These sessions will be recorded and available for later viewing. Live captioning is also available. You can click on the CC button on the bottom menu for various options. We invite you to turn your camera on if you like and settle in for the conversation, during which everyone except Chen Xin and myself will be muted. Feel free to add comments and questions in the chat, which tonight will be moderated by Sedilla member Sean Gasper Bai, a translator from Polish. For the second half of the session, we'll open the conversation. If you're comfortable speaking on screen, raise your hand either by clicking at the bottom of the participants list or by using the reactions button, and you'll be invited to unmute your microphone and ask the question yourself. Or if you prefer Sean to read your question, please send it privately to Sedilla in the chat. We'll try to get to all of them, but we apologize in advance if we run out of time. For those who are unable to attend our live events, we encourage you to email questions or comments before or after the sessions to translationclinics at centerforfiction.org. We hope to make these conversations ongoing to include viewers in as many time zones as possible. And now let's dive in. Today we have the good fortune to hear from Chen Xin Zhang. Chen Xin translates from Italian, German, and Chinese. Recent translation in, translations include Tears of Salt, A Doctor's Story by Pietro Bartolo and Lydia Tilotta, out from Norton, which was shortlisted for the 2019 Italian Prose and Translation Award. She has also been a recipient of the Words Without Borders American Academy of Poets Prize, as well as a Penn Heim Translation Grant, and also in 2019, she was a judge for the Lucin Strike Asian Translation Prize. She's a member of the Third Coast Translators Collective and a board member for the American Literary Translators Association. Chensin and I will discuss how we craft the backstories, both of the books we work on as well as our own, over the course of our developing careers. We will unpack some of our shared linguistic baggage, such as working in multiple language pairs and different genres, and talk about how to handle the temptations certain types of translation offer. First, a brief public service announcement. The American Literary Translators Association is now accepting applications for the 2022 Emerging Translator Mentorship Program. This program is designed to establish and facilitate a close working relationship between an experienced translator and an emerging translator on a project selected by the emerging translator. We are posting a link to more information in the chat. And since we hopefully have a lot of emerging translators in attendance tonight, we hope this information is useful to you. So Chen Xin, one thing I love about translation is discovering the stories behind the stories. These narratives can tell us a lot about a project or person and can also play a major role in pitching to publishers. Can you tell us about how you approach about your approach to crafting these backstories, both for your books and authors, as well as for yourself, and how it might have evolved over the course of your career? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so just to start with, by the way, um, thanks so much to um, both you guys at Sedilla and to the Center for Fiction for organizing. Um, and I know this sort of thing always takes like about, you know, between like three and 30 times more work than, than it probably looks like from the outside. So thanks so much for creating this occasion for us to have a conversation. Um, yeah, so in terms of, okay, so in terms of stories and backstories, 
um, I guess perhaps the first thing that I should say is that um, just from a sort of very practical point of view, um, obviously there's there's much more need to create a backstory for um, uh, uh, for a piece of work that you're pitching to a publisher compared to a piece of work that a publisher is pitching to you, you know, um, if or not pitching, but sort of offering to you to translate. Um, if it's that way around, then you probably um, learn all about the backstory. Um, and I have to admit that that is one of the things I, I rather like about um, sort of working in translation um, is that this book has already had, you know, one arguably like, uh, you know, one entire very full and ongoing life in some other language, sometimes in many languages before it gets to English. Um, and then you just get to enjoy all these backstories um, before you even start translating. Sometimes you even sort of benefit from them. So I remember um, once I translated a book from Chinese that already had an Italian translation. Um, the book is set in colonial Shanghai. Um, so it involved lots of place names. Um, and one of the things I did with the author, um, sort of close to the publication date was just double check the place names with him and uh, you know the place of people names with him and some other details and make sure that, that they were right. Um, and he was like, oh, you know, you had so many fewer questions than the Italian translator. And I was like, aha, well, that's because I've been benefiting from the Italian translator's work this entire time, anytime I needed to look something up. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's always fun. Um, but in kind of practical terms, sort of in terms of thinking like, you know, well, when it is up to me, to craft the backstory of, uh, of a translation or a work that I'm thinking about translating, um, how would I go about doing it? Um, I think one of the things that, you know, often sort of is a good starting point is that uh, often, particularly with, with, you know, books that you really wanted to translate, you started out as a reader first. Um, and that reading experience always seems to be a really nice place to, you know, start because, um, yeah, because sort of you had, you had a chance to experience this book um, and, um, and sort of find out what made it special, what makes it special and um, what you hope to bring to an English language audience. Um, and that's a really great place to start for a backstory. May I ask what that book was? Um, yeah, the, the Shanghai book. Um, it was um, a French concession by Xiao Bai. So it's this um, sort of noir um, novel set in the 30s. Um, and uh, actually I was, I think, so at the time I was, I had just spent two years living in Shanghai. Um, and obviously one of the, you know, really exciting and fun things about living in a big city is that um, is that there's you know so much history around you but in the case of Shanghai um, all of those places and like streets and place names had changed because um, they changed after 1949 um, when you know basically when, when the communist government took over um, and so it was sort of like I was getting to see a map overlaid on a place that I already knew um, with um, with a lot of people running around doing less than legal things in it. Anyway, it was a lot of fun. That adds a whole other layer to the backstory, <laughs> of course, that we were talking about, because I was thinking of it, you know, in terms of both our careers as translators, but also individual projects, but now you're taking it to the backstory of an entire place or city or, uh, you know, the streets and how I think, you know, so many different languages I actually can't think of a single language where this isn't an issue that names change over time, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's great. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, and I mean, I think this is also um, sort of, to your point, a kind of inevitable when you're sort of thinking about translating a book or, you know, doing a translation, obviously it's backstory intersects with your own, right? And it's like impossible to separate the work that you're doing from, um, from your own backstory, as it were, um, and, and to think of them together. So um, yeah, so that's just sort of a good example of that. Mm -hmm. 
So do you feel as though that's evolved a lot since, say, the first book that you did to the book that you're working on now? Um, I know certainly speaking from my own experience, you know, when you're just starting out, it's easy to feel like, oh, I don't have this massive bibliography to back me up. Um, if I'm looking at a project or reaching out to potential editors or publishers. Um, so did, did weaving together the backstories of the projects and your own experiences, uh, has that played a role in any of the books or has it evolved as you go? Oh, yeah. Hmm. Um, so I'd say probably, um, I mean, I'm lucky in that I often seem to translate, yeah, I often translate books that I really, really care about um, and books I sort of have a real connection to. And obviously, you know, that, as you we were saying, that connection you can often, um, you can often reasonably think of in sort of narrative terms. Um, I think, um in terms of uh talking to publishers mm, i suppose i should really do that um but i always feel a little bit shy you know like i'm uh, i'm always like here's a link to some things here you go you can take a look at it if you want or you know here's a bio i will like it, it's nice that lots of fishing can be done over email because i think if i had to like do it out loud i would die of embarrassment i'd be like you know here's a bio you can read it if you want goodbye <laughs> so um yeah so i think it does help in terms of sort of crafting a backstory for yourself as a translator um and it is tricky to get started um but um, yeah, but I think that's actually um, just a good plug for your earlier public service announcement. Um, so I, when I started translating, um, I did a mentorship through the British Centre for Literary Translation because I was, I was living in London at the time. Um, and it was really helpful. Um, and I think it gave me a little bit of confidence that you know, um, at the time I was like, oh, I haven't translated any books, you know, who's gonna take me seriously? Um, and now that I have done a couple, I still have trouble taking myself seriously. Um, so everybody who, you know, hasn't translated a book yet um, should feel less worried about it. And that also, um, I, I appreciate hearing you say you go for what I would term the soft pitch approach um, instead of the hard sell. I know that one of my own dear sort of informal mentors, completely foolhardy and reckless, um, when I was looking at how to transition from more nonfiction to literary translation, she just told me, well, you're either doing it or you're not. Um, so just do it, basically. <laughs> um, not something I can say to everyone, but yeah, uh, it sounds like you, you know, you found support systems uh, to get you where you are. You mentioned also the, so the, uh, the Italian translation helping you on a translation from Chinese into English. Um, and this, this gets to the heart of, uh, we, we, we discussed that we both work from multiple languages. Um, two of our languages overlap and you have a third on top of yeah. that. So, I, and I, yeah, I'm not even sure. I, yeah, there are like extremely few people with whom I have language overlap. So I was really excited to talk about this. Very few. Yeah, no, yeah. and it's exciting. I'm actually, yeah, they're not the most common. Um, <laughs> not the most, most common combinations. Um, so those come, they all come with baggage, right? I think um, it, there are various approaches to uh, learning new languages, certainly working from them, but do you, can you talk a little bit about, aside from, you know, using your knowledge of another language to help with another translation that you're working on, um, do you feel that there are differences? So, you know, certainly the working from different, you know, to not get too into the weeds in terms of um, grammar and syntax, but maybe we should get a little bit into the weeds how you balance that and, and how, you know, I frequently people ask me, well, how do you, you know, what do you do German in the morning and Italian in the afternoon, you know, the sort of nuts and bolts sort of thing. But I think given your range of experience, I'd love to hear how you approach it and how you feel as though that's influenced your approach to translation. Um, and especially with things like, you know, the syntax 
of, of Chinese comes with different challenges than the syntax of say German or Italian for when you bring it into English. So any yeah. thoughts you have on that? Yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts too. But um, I think one of the um, one of the big differences for me in terms of translating, you know, any European language, so German or Italian, versus translating Chinese, is that um, there's so many more. Um, so first of all, um, there's so many more false friends in German or Italian. You know, there. Um, there are more words that look like they could be the right translation and then turn out to be wrong. Um, whereas, uh, oh, you know, sometimes they look like the right translation and they turn out to make perfectly good sense, but th there's that too. Um, but that almost, um, you know, that hardly ever happens in Chinese. Um, and then similarly, I think um, it's often easy to think of a sort of sentence in English versus a sentence in German or something like that, you know, oh, well, well. Um, like sort of old linguistic gags about the verb coming at the end and stuff like that aside, um, it's certainly true that lots of, you know, in many ways you can make an English sentence that is syntactically similar to, to at least some German or Italian sentences. Um, there's always that there. Um, and I think sometimes it's helpful um, and sometimes it's, absolutely necessary, like sometimes, you know, there's something that the author's getting across um, using either, um, yeah, using the syntax of the sentence that it's actually possible and delightful to convey in English. Um, and sometimes it's not, and it's sort of a little bit of a distraction. Um, so I think that's, that's definitely something that doesn't come with the territory as much in, um, in Chinese. Um, and one of the things I enjoy about sort of translating from different languages is that, um, well, first of all, I think often, um, you know, translators translate because it allows you to work between languages and that's such a pleasure. Um, and then if you have more than one language, then it's sort of, slightly difficult to pass up the pleasure of working between more of those different languages that you enjoy. So there's that. Um, but then certainly also these languages are sort of fairly different from each other. Um, and that's kind of an extra enjoyable thing as well. Um, I have to admit that that's probably, I suppose, why I ended up with them, um, because I grew up, you know, speaking some Chinese. Um, and then I did Italian in school. And then when I started university, I was like, well, and I'm not recommending this to anybody as a language learning technique. And I'm not even saying it's true, but at the time I thought to myself, well, what if I learn a language that's more similar to Italian and, uh, you know, or another romance language basically and lose my Italian? I'd be really sad about that. Um, oh no, let me go and learn something different. Like, you know, Russian seems really difficult. So uh, like German instead. Um, and yeah, so in a way, I think I ended up with these languages precisely because they're, they're sort of in many ways quite different from each other. Mm -hmm. It's interesting you mentioned that because I was surprised at how many similarities I found between German and Italian mm -hmm. that aren't, I, I think once you're in it, you, you know it, but um, coming from the North American perspective, it's like, oh, the Romance language and the Germanic, you know, the, the very different, separated by the Alps. Um, yeah. Whereas, you know, the construction of past tense, concepts of formality, and of course, all these things change over time as well. But I was, I, I found it very interesting that there are more, yeah. sim I found more similarities than I ever expected. Um, yeah. And like I said, certainly not recommending it to anyone as a, as a language learning um, um, heuristic of anything since learning German. While, you know, I, I really enjoy and I'm glad to know German. I have certainly regretted many times not having French or Spanish for that matter. So um, yeah, so that's a whole. <laughs> but there are, there's only so much time, right? So much time. Um, and the immersion that translation requires, I think. Um, this is something that hasn't yet come up in our literary translation clinic series, um, but this 
you know, I feel as though when I'm, when I'm speaking to someone who's not immersed as much as we are necessarily in the world of books or of translation, um, you know, that phenomenon that I feel is completely facilitated by YouTube of people having a cursory knowledge. It came up a little bit with Pete Buttigieg um, at the presidential campaign. I'm really not going to get us as, as off course <laughs> as I sound like I am. But this idea that you can collect languages. Um, and I don't, I guess, what is my question there for you? Um, because in having read your work, it was very clear to me um, you mentioned caring deeply about the, the books that you translate um, and also that nuance of what an editor or publisher brings to you versus what you bring to them. And I wonder, I guess I just want to bring that up for the audience, um, you know, that, that the, the depth with which you care for the work. Um, and I don't want, I don't want either of us to come off as, you know, oh, translate for more languages um no 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 <laughs> certainly not claiming that I could learn more languages and then translate from them that seems like well yeah um, so you know that's a that's a much higher mountain to climb than I than I necessarily plan on climbing mm. and we had we had talked a little bit um previously about these temptations you know you mentioned the false friends um, do you ever find, do you need to deploy specific strategies to avoid that? I mean, are you, do you know immediately, oh, the false friend is not what I'm going to grab? Um, I find for myself, those come up sometimes in my rough, rough drafts, you know, and it's a matter of reworking them and, and eradicating them from, you know, the, the English version. But um, do you have approaches that you use? Do you, do you ever succumb to those temptations or are you just aware of them and they don't, they don't affect your work? Sometimes they're good temptations, right? I mean, sometimes it is the right word. Um, so yeah, I mean, I would definitely say the, um, as I'm sure um, you can attest, uh, the the experience of producing a rough draft is just so different from the experience of producing a polished translation. Um, and actually I have to admit that I don't, I don't always enjoy the sort of rough draft stage um, nearly as much as I could, you know, wax lyrical about enjoying the later stages, um, just because so often, you know, you're reading this really beautiful sentence or this really beautiful work that you care very deeply about. Um, and then you make a like sort of bad echo of it or something um, full of temptations and other pitfalls. And you're like, well, this is not really quite that other thing. Um, but uh, yeah, I would say, I mean, I'm not sure that they necessarily show up more in the rough draft, but I would say at least, you know, they sort of present themselves they present themselves to you, cognates and false friends, you know, cognates, which may or may not be false friends. Um, and you have to choose whether or not to use them. Um, it's not like, it's not like, you know, even if it doesn't end up making its way into any draft, it's not like it wasn't already there, if you know what I mean. Um, just by virtue of sort of you're having a little, um, yeah, like having a little linguistic echo in your mind. Mm -hmm. I find I flip back and forth between feeling like the first draft is the most agonizing and, and laborious versus the later stages of refining. And I, I don't know if that depends on the writer or the text or the, the nature of what the story is. I don't know. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, ultimately they all feel like a lot of work, but. That's certainly true, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I just want to be mindful of time. Um, so you and I also mentioned, this is sort of an extra question I wanted to throw in before we open it up to the audience. Um, you know, we talked about the enthusiasm of, um, you know, you, you mentioned benefiting from the backstories of other, other translations of originals. Um, and also I wanted to ask you about, um, how we 
I mean, how we keep ourselves going is not the best way to, is not the most felicitous phrase, I feel like, but because we have such a degree of enthusiasm, you know, having you, and you also mentioned, you know, the translator first approaches a text as a reader, right? So we, we read it, we take it in, we have this certain experience. And then uh, once it's either, you know, once the deal is done and, and we're, we've committed to it, you know, there is that sheer labor of um, doing, doing the original justice and this completely new work. So I'm wondering if you have any tactics or approaches to how we keep ourselves going once our enthusiasm has waned. Um, you know, I, I think um, I certainly have this feeling that uh, once I start, I'm excited about the book and then I, at a certain point, whether it's the middle or page two or page 430, I feel as though I'm adrift on a sea of words and a lot more words. Um, and I think that is a fun, a difference between translation and writing, right? Writers don't always know how long their work is going to be. Translators more or less have an idea or yeah. at least how much we're working through. So how do you grapple with that? Um, yeah, you can't be like, there are like 780 words left in this chapter when you're writing, um, which is its own problem, I suppose. Um, but the translators is a different one. Um, so I think maybe just, um, uh, I'll just mention a couple of things. Um, one is uh, a very sort of tactical one, um, and I, I don't think it would work for everyone's schedule, but thus far it's worked for mine. Um, I don't translate on days when I already have something else huge to do, if that makes sense. Like, it, it just doesn't work for me to, you know, come back from a whole day of, like, I don't know, doing something else, like, like teaching or some, yeah, working or whatever. And then, um, and then also translating, like, that really doesn't, uh, like, I can't do that. I, I'm already depleted. Um, and if I come to translation fresh at the beginning of the day, um, I find it much easier to sort of, you know, have all the enthusiasm that I started out, um, that I started out with um, for the book. Um, I think, so that's one thing. Um, the other is, it's a little cheesy, so I'm going to have to try and figure out how to say this, but um, I really do think that fellow translators keep me going. Um, translators are just um, such fun people and lovely to hang out with. Um, and lovely to talk to about these, this thing we all do. Um, and that's something I really enjoy and it helps to keep me going. Um, and um, yeah, and then uh, one other final thought is that, um, is that, so I think we we'd earlier talked about, you know, sort of translating books that you really care about. Um, and one of the things that, um, surprised me I think when I started translating was that sometimes books are about like an issue that I really care about um, and I was sort of almost surprised by how once you start translating the experience of translating the book is just an experience of translating you know and I suppose I should say something more con that makes this more concrete but um, Tears of Salt the book that you held up earlier um, is about the a doctor who's working on Lampedusa um, who um, and about the sort of Mediterranean refugee crisis or yeah that's right um, and um, the the year that I started working on it I was living in Berlin um, I it was one of those bad news cycle years for when when for a variety of reasons you won't go into I was sort of reading the news far too much for many different reasons um, and just sort of thinking, you know, like, what can I do about this? Um, and then when um, the UK publisher, uh, Macahos Press, approached me um, about doing this book, I was like, oh, that would be fantastic. I would get to, you know, work on this, um, work on this amazing story um, by, um, by someone doing work that I really respect. Um, that's also about a cause that's very dear to my heart. Um, and then I felt like that lasted about, you know, maybe like two and a half minutes. 
into the process of translating before it felt like a normal translation where, you know, there are like 750 words left in the chapter and you still have to, to get through all of them. Um, so a question came through in the chat. Right, we'll get to that question, but now that you mentioned the UK edition, I'm actually remembering yes. also that you have just touched on the title of our event <laughs> this evening about what's in a title. Yeah. Um, and the backstories of, yeah, how did you get to, I mean, it was originally La Crime di Sale, right? Yes, it was originally and, that. And the US version is Tears of Salt, but the UK version, which I don't have, so I can't show people the cover. Um, what was that title and why was it different? That title was um, Lampedusa Gateway to Europe. Um, and um, I admittedly, uh, in preparation for this, um, went back through old emails today, trying to figure out whether I had a definitive statement about why it was different. Um, I gathered from sort of conversations that one of the reasons was just because um, it was such a topical book, you know, it's just such a topical um, book at the time. It was uh, something that's in the news a lot. Um, and the the publishers or the, the editors really wanted to sort of make that clear and make it clear what the book was about um, to a UK audience, I think in a way that was sort of much closer to home for them than potentially for an American audience. Um, in the US, I think, um, you know, first of all, um, that was all less in the news and probably less pressingly relevant. Um, I think actually it potentially almost makes it easier for US readers to connect with the book. Like I think by the time it came out in the UK, I forget the exact timing, um, there had already been lots and lots and lots of coverage of this issue. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, um, I think the titles are fascinating things. I'm actually not very good at them. Um, but in any case, um, I, at least my experience as a translator has been that often publishers have stronger opinions about titles and sort of ideas about how they want to use them, how they feel the title positions the book in the market and so on. Absolutely. And then those, sometimes I've been somewhat privy to very interesting conflict between the marketing department and the editorial department. But we'll save that for another clinic. Yes. Um, so shall I shall I open up? Um, we do already have a question in the chat, but let me just um, bring in the rest of the audience. And now that we're moving into the question and answer period, we invite you to turn your camera on if you like. To repeat, if you're comfortable speaking on screen, raise your hand either by clicking at the bottom of the participants list or by using the reactions button, and you'll be invited to unmute your microphone and ask the question yourself. If you prefer for Sean to read your question for you, just send it privately to Sedilla in the chat. We'll try to get to all of them, but we apologize in advance if we run out of time. So our first question that's come in um, to the chat is the story of how you discovered a book or an author sometimes easier to tell than the stories of yourself or of the book itself? Are there times when we shouldn't lean too heavily on that? Ooh, good question. Um, hmm. I think possibly, um, you know, sort of the answer that comes to us immediately to mind for me is, um, yes, it's easier to talk about that in conversation, um, but actually possibly more difficult to do in, you know, uh, say for instance, like a professional context or a pitching context. Um, I'm thinking about this recently because, um, because I did a couple of um, pitch sessions as part of the online Alta conference. Um, and um, yeah, and I think it, it really is possibly easiest for, you know, for introducing a book to someone who's never come across it before um, to just do the story of the book itself um, and just say, you know, here's what I think it's fantastic. Um, and the I discovered it this way angle is sometimes a little sort of 
at least in my experience, a little too indirect for the amount of time that one has or the amount of space on a page or in an email. Yep, Allison, would you like to unmute yourself? Thank you. Uh, thanks, this is fascinating to hear both of you talking about all of these um, experiences and ideas. And I guess sort of in, this, in a kind of coming off of the answer, Shinshin, that you just were giving, uh, it's a, my question is about like when we're crafting these backstories and maybe we're having trouble making them connect with um, whether or not it's readers or you know if we're trying to place a book um, a project you know submitting it to editors or if it's a stories or something or trying to introduce an author or things like that um, I was wondering if either of you wanted to talk about that kind of an experience where um, you know you feel compelled sometimes to tailor what the backstory or the the baggage might be to sort of sell it. I don't know if you have that experience. I definitely do. I'm thinking about it. Uh, if you want to jump in for a moment, Alta, please feel free. If not, I will. I can jump in very briefly. This <laughs> happened to me last week. Um, I had been in touch with an agent who was pitching uh, a new novel by an author I adore. So I would love to work on this novel. Um, and this agent sent me, oh, I've, I've sent it to XYZ. Um, and some of these people I was following up with, some I was not. And, um, you know, apparently an offer came in. Um, so I sent a note and I just found myself because I, um, Chansin, you, you mentioned um, feeling, I don't know if you said shy. Um, I'm not, I don't love <laughs> pitching. It makes me incredibly uncomfortable. I feel as though, you know, it's a, if I, it's a brilliant book. Um, I have difficulty sometimes making the case for it and to not even talk about why making the case that I would be the right person to work on the book. Um, so, but I, I, I realized with this particular book, you know, there has never been, this is sort of a, a this book that I'm sorry, I can't talk about details <laughs> because it's still <laughs> in the works, but it is a new take on a classic major epic tale. And what occurred to me was there has never been, uh, we've, we, in the US, readers have encountered different interpretations of this tale from all different places, some in translation, some not. Um, but it had never been told by an author from the place where the epic tale is ostensibly set. So I said, look, this would be, the, the to my knowledge, the first um, English language version of the story coming from an author from the actual place. I don't know if that's making sense. Um, and I only mention it because the, the editor wrote back to me and said, that's a brilliant pitch. Now, whether they're going to acquire the rights to this book, I have no idea, but I had never, you know, as someone who's, who is often, I'm very insecure about pitching. Um, I just felt like, you know, one sentence, make the case, that's how I felt. Um, and it might go to some, it might go to a publisher in a different territory, I don't know. Um, but that was gratifying to have sort of my instinctive, like how, instead of boiling down all this other stuff, it's like looking at the story of the author and the story itself and interpret that for a North American audience. Um, but yeah, Chansin, what about you? Oh man, pitching is so hard. Um, and I think, um, one of the things that's difficult about it is that often if you're, you know, if you're attracted to a book or you really want to, you know, it's a brilliant project you really want to work on, possibly in your mind, it's something along the lines of, you know, this is a really great retelling of an epic tale. Um, and it's hard to make that sort of extra connection because whatever it is, I mean, you know, let's say it's the first time you, an author from this place has, um, has done a retelling of this story. That's not the reason per se why you love the book necessarily, um, but it might be a really great pitch. In fact, it might be the better pitch 
Um, and I do think I sometimes sort of struggle to, um, to, to think of those things. Um, I will say probably um, what ends up happening to me more is um, that I have found an author um, that whose work I really enjoy. Um, and then maybe I even, you know, get in touch with them and just sort of make sure that it's it's okay to start translating or it's, it's sort of, that's, that's fine with them. Um, and then I'm like already, you know, like months and months later, I'm like slightly knee deep, have already done like a sal or something. And then I'll be like, oh yeah, now I better think about this. Like, how am I going to explain to anyone else why they should read this book um, or why I should translate it for them as the case may be. Um, and I think the good thing about doing that is that obviously the process of translation is itself a process of discovery. So um, by doing that, you get to know the book better. Um, but yeah, by then it's just sort of like, well, I'm like in over my head now, so I better convince somebody else that this is a good idea. Excellent. Uh, Alex, you have a question. Hello. Hi. Thank you so much, Chen Sin. Thank you, Alta. You brought up so many different juicy subjects, hard to pick one to focus on, but um, this idea of backstory, I was thinking about um, something I've been experiencing lately, which is that the time it takes between when a book comes out and when um, I or an agent uh, actually start sending it to editors, never mind when I might start translating the book and never mind when the book is going to be published, right? We're talking about usually a significant lag time. And um, so I'm wondering if either of you have a story, positive, negative, you know, good, bad, indifferent, or, or thoughts about um, how to deal with that because a book, you know, I'm, I, I realize I'm translating over the past, like say, <clears throat> two years or so, three different books from Czech that were all published in 2017. And I've noticed a particular issue that's come up in all three of them, which has to do with things that were happening in the five years before that in the Czech Republic and in, let's say, that part of Europe and in Europe, which is no longer happening. And so I feel like there are things that I might have to explain in a way that would be possibly even uh, awkward or uncomfortable because they're not happening now. Um, but I wouldn't have had to explain those things at the time. Do you know what I mean? Does that, is this making any sense? So any thoughts on that or experiences you can share? Thank you. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and I think it, um, on the, um, on the pitching question, obviously, you know, it sort of timeliness impacts the um, impacts the pitch and the publishing process as well, right? So sometimes, um, as with a book like Tears of Salt, for instance, a publisher might think, you know, um, well, this is a really important subject now, but like, I don't know, like, you know, like, <laughs> uh, like two years from now, who's going to want to read about X, right? Like whatever X may be. Um, I think, in terms of, um, yeah, I'm struggling to think of a sort of like timeliness issue I faced before that involves sort of having to explain more context to the reader, um, but perhaps Alta has an example of that, or I can do some more thinking while she talks. <laughs> the first thing that comes to mind is a book I'm translating right now um, that came out in German in March, and it includes tweets. And some of the tweets are made up and some are from actual individuals who contributed to the book through tweets. Um, now, as a reader, to me, the context and some of the things that are happening in the book make it very clear. But I think, um, and again, I'm not done with the process, so I will probably have a different answer for you when I am. But the author actually addressed some of those things head on in her afterward. She said, okay, 
this, um, you know, this happened. My story is partially modeled on this real life event. Um, this other character is based on this other person. So she unpacked some of it, which was helpful for me as a reader, just in terms of confirming my suspicions um, as I read it. And it, it, it helps, it helps me in the sense that, oh, I don't feel like I have to uh, unpack that in, in my translation. Um, and Alex, actually, I'm not clear on your question. Like, do you feel like you have to unpack that in the pitch or in the work itself? Did you? I was, I was actually talking that? about the pitch rather than in the work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's also an interesting question about the work. <laughs> yeah, but I think it's almost trickier in the pitch because, um, in the work itself, well, I mean, there like there are lots of the work is the work, right? Like there are lots of different strategies you could potentially use to um, to help orient the reader. Um, whereas the pitch is like it's compressed. Um, there's there's a very definite. It's like yeah, going somewhere with a really definite purpose in mind, um, and um, maybe a little bit less freedom on that front. Yeah, sorry, I don't have a better answer than that, Alex. Uh, I see uh, Sean has a question. I, I hope it's not cheating for me to, to ask a question, but I am really curious. I'm really into this whole idea of, um, of uh, uh, sort, sort of like seeing a book's backstory as part of, as part of the pitching process and as part, of, as part of like what helps you bring it to, to English language readers. And so I'm really curious um, because you're both translators who work from multiple languages. I'm wondering if across your different languages, you find different preconceptions about the types of backstories that, that there are going to be from, from, you know, also in your case, from Italian books versus German books. Um, and do you find yourself having to, do you find yourself having to compensate for that when you're talking to publishers or to agents or or even to readers? Do you find yourself having to position books differently in terms of that backstory because of, because of just the language they were first written in? Yeah, um, so um, I think that's obviously a great question and um, reminds me of how, okay, so I haven't been in bookstores nearly as much recently um, as I had previously, but um, back in the ancient pre-pandemic days, um, it always used to bother me that like, you know, if you sort of walk over to a shelf of books about China, um, lots of them have like, far too many of them have red spines, you know, like they look like um, someone, um, someone put them together who um, really want to arrange their bookshelf, uh, you know, it, like in rainbow colors or something along those lines. Uh, but like, do all the China books have to have red spines? Um, but I think they're definitely, um, I think, yes, I mean, obviously, there's, um, there's an element of what people expect from, um, from a particular culture um, or a particular language uh, that can be as reductive as like, well, here's the color of the book spine. Um, or the book cover, um, but I think also, um, and um, I imagine also might have something to, uh, some things to say about this as well. Um, one of the things I've really enjoyed and tried to do um, is sort of translating from the peripheries of these languages. Um, so for instance, um, I did a book that was by a Swiss author um, from German. Um, and honestly, I'm not sure what I'm not sure that I know what publishers expect from a Swiss book, um, but in any event, it's, you know, not a German book. And then whatever sort of um, reductive picture you have in your mind, because it's a German book, um, well, you can get rid of that one and try and come up with a different one. Um, and I think in terms of um, the, the backstory of the book and sort of the reading experience, um, that was also kind of, you know, that, that was a challenge to convey as well. Um, so the book itself has a fair amount of um, Swiss German in it, just sort of sprinkled through. Um, and one of the points that it makes um, in passing is that 
um, there is so much variety within Swiss German anyway, right? Like, you know, um, any given village could have a slightly different, um, or possibly even like a mutually unintelligible um, dialect from like the next village and the next mountain or whatever it is. Um, and I, I mean, that comes up in the book um, and getting to preserve some of that um, or, you know, just sometimes just using the words themselves, um, that was really fun. Um, but also I think on some level, just sort of practically unimaginable for a speaker of a dominant language, you know, like, like English, um, that is just much, much less, um, I, I mean, there's, how should I put this? Okay, I'm talking myself into a corner here, but let me try again with a completely new sentence. Um, and I guess what I mean is there's lots of variety in English, um, but there's much less sort of immediately, there's much less density of like sort of geographical variety of English than there is with say, you know, Swiss German. Um, and it's just a crazy idea. It's, you know, sort of mind blowing. Um, and that's part of this, the backstory of this book that I was trying to convey. That's great. I think I'm going to be incredibly reductive in my answer to your question, Sean. And I guess it's basically, yes, I think about this all the time. The cliches, especially having grown up in the US um, and having grown up in a small town um, the and then lived in a big city, uh, you know, people bring their own baggage to work. It, people being the reader, but people also editors and publishers and agents. So I am always thinking about, okay, what are some potential presumptions? I mean, the stereotypes, the cliches, the book I'm currently translating plays with those cliches. So that's great, you know, and sometimes in positioning work, I think you can use it to challenge those cliches. Other times I do read some things. I usually don't end up pitching them or wanting to translate them that completely sort of play into those cliches. Um, and I think that's something that every translator needs to keep in mind, um, the kind of work that they want to do. Uh, but I'm going to cut myself short in the interest of time because we did get a question from Evan in the audience, if there's still time, which there is, how can we help contextualize a work that is less plot based? They say, I have some semi autobiographical works in mind that are hard to boil down to story beats. Um, Chensin, do you have any? I feel like what you just said about dialects um, and varieties of German in Switzerland kind of speaks to that actually. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, okay, I'm gonna take a stab and then, uh, did you say it's Evan? Evan can tell you if it's helpful or not. Um, so I think on the occasions when I have, um, you know, on the occasions that I have um, pitched something that is more plot-based, um, I'm honestly not very sure that the plot plays into the pitch very much more than, you know, it's a this type of novel or it's a that type of novel. Um, in, in the sense that I don't think, I mean, obviously an editor wants to know that uh, a story is sort of tightly written and it, it makes sense and, you know, it's going somewhere. Um, but yeah, but I think it's sort of equally okay to be like, here's what this book is about. Um, and here's its story, um, which is not necessarily a linear story in the sense that it gets you from point, point A to point B, um, but it's still a story. And my instinctual idea about that question is to, if it's not plot-based, um, and I would make the case that there's a lot of literature that might at first seem plot-based, but actually, um, it not it's not necessarily the plot it also depends on who you're pitching so what that press does you know are they strictly plot driven or can the case be made it is something stylistic or character driven um and 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 discuss that um so i do want to save a couple a little bit of time for our final question that we ask every single participant in these clinics 
what would an ideal future of literary translation translation look like for you, Chemsin? Yeah, okay, so I was thinking about this question um, and I thought, you know, well, um, I'm a translator. Um, I translate and I love reading translations. Um, and it's gonna be really difficult for me to say something that is both A, honest and B, does not consist in saying, you know, more translation, more please, more, more, more. Um, but then I sort of thought about, you know, why, um, uh, why that's the case. Like, like what, you know, what would be served by having more translation in, in all, you know, of different authors, like in different forms and so on. Um, and one of the things I think is serendipity. Um, so I always really, you know, I get a special kick out of it when um, someone who hasn't necessarily been looking out for a translation um, happens to come across a book I translated. Like I remember one of my, um, um, one acquaintance said, you know, she um, just like sort of, picked it up in the library or something like that. Um, and then ages later we met and she sort of put two and two together and she was like, oh yeah, you translated that book that I like enjoyed that I got out of the library one day. Um, and obviously, you know, if translations are like some minuscule single digit percentage of all of the books that are translated, that's just less likely to happen. Than if translations, uh, then if you're more likely to pick a translation off the shelf. Um, and um, yeah, and I think that's, you know, um, speaking of backstories, just one of the most wonderful ways of finding books is not like, oh, I had to read it for this reason or this other reason, but I came across this book and it was really great. Um, and it was honestly a little bit greater than I thought it was going to be necessarily or than I expected. Um, and yeah, so a future with more of that happening in translation would be really amazing. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. Thank you so, all so much for joining us. And thank you again to the Center for Fiction for hosting these clinics. And thank you again, Chansin, for joining us tonight. Translation clinics take place generally, ex with the exception of tonight, which as you all know is Wednesday, generally they're on the third Thursday of every month. Please sign up to be notified of upcoming events. Please keep your eye on the Center for Fiction's website for more info about the upcoming clinics. The registration link is in the chat and on the Center for Fiction's website. We look forward to seeing you again. Please stay safe.